Our New Testament reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we're children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Let us bow in prayer. O Lord, our God, be with us by your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and our minds to hear your words. Bless, O Lord, the words of your servant, and may they reach the hearts of your people, and will you use your word to bless us together, to rejoice, and to know that you are our Father, who loves us, who cares for us, who provides for our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Father's Day, as you're well aware, time to honor our fathers. And so I wanted to try to combine the, the Father's Day emphasis with some help to families and what needs to be done in our day and combine that with our adoption into God's family. I don't know if I've succeeded. I think maybe I've bit, bitten off more than you all can chew. <laughs> But I, I hope it's a, I hope I can at least keep you awake. But we want to acknowledge on this Father's Day not only our own fathers, and not only children in your families who call you father, but in doing that we want to acknowledge that God in his infinite wisdom has declared his overall design for the family itself to be the very core of our earthly society. And quite honestly, 
that family as God designed it to operate in society is in big trouble today because of all the attacks on family, sexual orientation, all those things that are going on. We see at the very beginning, God created created male and female. Genesis 1.27, he bound them together in an intimate relationship of marriage. Genesis 2.24, man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And then God gave them the cultural, we call the cultural mandate to be fruitful and fill the earth and subdue it. And as we know, this paradisical situation was destroyed by sin. And in our day, we continue to see the results, the effects of that ongoing unrighteousness of mankind because of sin. And we see it in ways in which that unrighteousness is displayed in marriage, family, sexual orientation. And we need to be reminded that as Christians, we need to live out our biblical family values as a way to help to redeem our very culture from its destructive ways. And in doing that, we also honor our Heavenly Father. And this day you have honored your fathers. Maybe you've sent a card or received a card, a gift card, a tie, a belt, a socks, a coffee mug, and you know, various kind of standard Father's Day gifts, handcrafted objects to let uh, you know that you're respected and well thought of. And uh, perhaps your children have given you something to let you know that you are special. I'll tell you the one that scares me, though, is that the coffee mug or the tie that says world's greatest father. Do you, Rick, do you realize the stress that that puts on fathers? Do you realize that there is no father that can perform at that level? It's impossible. We're not perfect. I know I'm not. I've made lots of mistakes. I've failed. But how would you even determine the world's greatest father? Now, is it a contest? Do you answer a questionnaire online? You know, do you fill it in or do you send your, send your uh, children to another family so they can experience that father? Or, uh... You know what I'd, I'd really be happy with, though, is it's just a card that says, world's good enough, Dad. <laughs> Expectations are lowered. <laughs> Stress is off. The pressure decreases and... and yeah, then there is room that we can strive to be better. We can strive to be what God wants us to be in the midst of our families. And today, I want you to see how God's glory and God is glorified in being our Father to all who believe in Jesus. And I want you to get a sense of what God the Father has done in our behalf to get us back into the family. In one respect, it's, it's very simple. We trust Jesus. And he adopts us as sons. But taking what the Bible teaches and trying to understand that, reveals to us that God, the Father, went to such great extent, went to such great means to get us back into that position so that in seeing that, our awareness of what God has done for us grows and we stand in awe and amazement of our Father. The Bible tells us then that there is a perfect heavenly father who shows us the way. And we need that help. 
we need to be shown because on our own we could never have found it ourselves. It all started good at creation. God saw that it was good and everything was there, but you know what happened. Sin, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God and by that disobedience brought into mankind's being that destructive power of sin. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, their sin pervasively affected all of creation. Sin affected not only their minds, but because we are related to Adam and Eve, it affected our minds. Our thinking is wrong. Our bodies are subject to pain and distress and death and sickness and illness. Sin affects our creation. We are under a curse. The world is under a curse. Productivity is hard labor and nothing is perfect. And sin affects our relationships. Adam and Eve were alienated from God and so all who come from natural generation from Adam and Eve are as well alienated from God and they were cast from the garden. Their children were alienated from each other. Cain killed Abel. Even Father Abraham, who stands as a respected patriarch, and indeed he was and is, but even his own heart was affected by that fall and the relationship suffered. And you remember a couple of times in his own existence, he lied about his wife being his sister. Due to sin, every area, everything is affected and touched by sin. So our Shorter Catechism, Westminster Shorter Catechism, Shorter Catechism 19 says, All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Paul, again, as he writes in Romans, says in chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You see, I go into this detail so that we again realize how bad off we are in sin, how far away from God we are. And it's into this hopeless, dismal, horrible situation that no man of himself is able to deal with or to escape unless unless and this is the good news of the gospel this is the good news of the restored fellowship we have with God this is the good news of being adopted as his sons Unless that perfect father in heaven implants, implements his plan to bring us back into his family through the work of his son. And I also want you to see here today that the work of the Trinity, because it's God the Father who adopts us in. It's, it's the work of the Son, God the Son, who accomplishes it with his life and death and resurrection. And finally, it's the work of God, the Holy Spirit, who empowers us by that Spirit to be 
what God wants us to be. The Father sent a Savior who would forgive us and save us and bring us back into his family. The second thing, the perfect heavenly Father adopts us into his family. Think of a couple of verses, Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. As the Father, God the Father is the source of our new life, who gives it to those who don't deserve it, who creates it in us, though we never would have turned to him on our own. Now, we're familiar with the term adoption. Definition is simply to take a child of other parents as one's own child. It's a usually a lengthy process. It's very involved. It takes time and effort. It takes finances. It takes legal representation for all the work through the the paperwork that needs to be done. But once completed, that child is part of the family, legally, fully, in every way. And what a happy day that is, taken from a sometimes a terrible existence and brought in to a new life. And that's the picture that the Bible gives us of our adoption into God's family, taken from a terrible, horrible existence that only winds up in death and brought into a new family that brings life and peace and joy forever. That's what God the Father does through his Son. And we who are by birth children of the devil are adopted into God's family and become children of God that the amazing gracious news, and that's the amazing gracious news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to what John says. John 1 verse 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. He gave the right to become the children of God. Family of God today, you are children of God through Jesus Christ. No longer children of the devil. No longer children condemned under the law. But have new life in him. And God worked that all out in his wonderful plan. Sin brings us into all mankind, into alienation from God and no desire to return to him. But by his goodness... He brings us to himself. God the Father offered God the Son, Jesus, to accomplish redemption for all his people. By Jesus' perfect life, his atoning death on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins so that those who believe would be made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the great purpose of our redemption, that we might become the righteousness of God as sons, daughters in his family. Now, there's a lot in that, and Reformed theologians like to unpack things from biblical truth in a logical, systematic, analytical way and I want to do that a little bit with you today. Hopefully we can move through this uh, quickly. 
because I'm just going to touch the high points. But theologians have called this the ordo salutis, which is Latin for the order of salvation. How does it all look? How does it all work out going from a child of the devil to a child of God? What's all involved? And in seeing what's involved, that shows us how great and amazing God is and is what he's done for us in restoring that fellowship. These, there are seven things here that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, and they're logical in their order. They're kind of analytical in their order. They, some may or may not be temporal in how they happened. It, it may not be simply a one follows the other. Some are one following the other. But it's here in a kind of a form that, that makes us get the whole picture and say, wow. Look what God has done. And it starts by being effectually called by the Father himself. Now, the Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. How, we, we can't hear, we can't see, we're dead in sin. So how does the Father call us? Well, John 10, Jesus says this in verses 3 and 7. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And they know his voice. See, this is, this is the guarantee that those whom God calls will in fact hear because God has begun the work. And they will respond. We see that in the next one. We are regenerated. You know that passage from John 3 where Nicodemus and Jesus are talking and he tells them you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. You must be born again. Regeneration means born again. It's that new life, that spiritual new life that God by his spirit, that principle that he puts in the hearts of those he calls to open their ears, to open their eyes, to hear the good news of the gospel. This is preparatory work. This, this may go on without our even knowing it. Because what happens next is that we're brought to that place where we are converted, which is composed of repentance and faith. These, these things you know. Maybe I'm just trying to put them in a little different order or way in which you can see how they work together. This is, this is what we're most familiar with. Acts 2.38, Peter replied to the people that he, to whom he preached on Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent. And the baptism expressed that belief. And of course, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so in that conversion, we recognize that we are sinners. We have offended God. We are alienated from God. We need to repent of that sin. We have broken his law. And so we turn in repentance and we turn in faith to the one whom God has provided for our salvation the one who loved us and gave himself for us, the one who paid for our sins on the cross, and we turn to him, we confess to him that we are sinners deserving of death. But we believe in him who died for our sins and forgives us. And then we are justified, that's the fourth thing, Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That idea of reconciliation. Now we're no longer alienated. We're no longer enemies of God, but we have been justified. We've been made righteous. We've been declared righteous. It's a legal term. Not guilty. That's our standing. Before it was guilty. Now it's not guilty. Before it was death. Now it's life. Before it was children of Satan, now it's children of God. We become new people, forgiven.
But not even that's the end of the story. For you see, now, the fifth thing, we are adopted into God's family. John 1, 12. Yet to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. Now that standing is ours. We're part of God's family by faith in Christ, who has forgiven us, cleansed us, and puts us in that family. We are legally his. And he did all that for me. He did all that for you. I didn't deserve it. You don't deserve it. We're all sinners. But that's what he did. And so we sit here today as part of his family, worshiping him in joy. In that amazing realization of the extent to which he went for us. The God of heaven, of all the universe, who sits enthroned and has every molecule of this whole world under his control, and he looked at us in love. We're adopted into his family. The sixth thing is now we're sanctified. He gives us the power to put off the old self, Ephesians 4. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He's given us a new desire to obey him. He's given us a new walk, a new life. Oh, we fail, we, we sin, but he continues to forgive. He's given us that new life to please him, to glorify him in everything that we do. And we have, by his spirit, the power more and more in our character and in our actions to be what, the, what our heavenly father wants us to be as his sons and daughters. And then finally, ultimately, when Christ returns, we are raised, our bodies are raised from the dead. They're glorified and they're reunited with our souls. And we will be in his house forever and ever and ever. John 6, verse 40. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. There's a picture of what God has done for us from calling to glorification, the whole journey of our spiritual life, and we stand in awe and amazement of what he has done as our father to make us his children. What an awesome privilege to know God as our father, even as he's taught us to pray that in his prayer he gave to his disciples, our father. So we're here today and we rejoice that this Father's Day, God is our Father. And by faith, we're in his family. Being part of that family is open to all who confess and trust Jesus knowing what God has done to bring us to that place where we even are able to offer that faith and trust in him. And so the invitation is always before us to trust him. You need to know him as savior so that you're part of his family. Thirdly, the perfect heavenly father is our pattern. We said earlier that Marriage, family, sexual identity is affected by sin. We can't turn around or read the newspapers or watch the news without some LGTB rights issue going on. It puts sexual identity as a choice to be made rather than an order of creation. Marriage itself as a formal covenant between a man and a woman 
often discarded. Divorce, though God has given some limitations to it, is often taken from its biblical parameters. Sometimes children come into life without the context of a traditional family. And sometimes lifestyles leave children often without help or supervision or abused and not receiving care. And as our culture moves more and more away from biblical family principles, it's up to us as believers who are part of God's family to express in our own families what we experience in God's family. And the Holy Spirit enables us to do that. It's just a, a few tips, if you will, from Scripture. Fathers, we need to admit we need help and ask for it. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11, Which of you, if, he, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a, a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So we're encouraged to be gift givers to our children. Not wrapped up presents, but the gifts of love and praise and encouragement and support and time and the gift of yourself to those in your families. To give those physical, emotional, nutritious gifts. Not snake and stones. And so Jesus in John 14, 2 says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Giving to our children, preparing, providing for them. Provisions of food and clothing and shelter are basic. But there's provision for interactions with the larger family to foster a, a sense of fitting in together with the, the broader family. Sometimes families are stressed and broken, but there's value in seeing how we fit together with a broader, in a broader picture. And not only blood relatives, but the family of the church, God's family. With the saints in worship, we gather together as brothers and sisters together, worshiping God, our Father. Focus on the family. Growing up, children in the home, it may be difficult. There are all kinds of ways to pull you and take time away with your work and all kinds of other things. But be focused. It goes too quickly. I was reading a letter from our, one of our missionaries in China, Jeremiah Montgomery, the other day, and he was reflecting on his family, young children there in China. He says it's been said that if you have children in the home, the nights are long, but the years fly. <laughs> That's true. Then establish a positive home environment, 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work. Negative, harsh criticism is not a good environment in which to grow positive, achieving, successful children. So like our Heavenly Father, be encouraging, supportive, helpful, reassuring, and accepting. And be consistent in expectations. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Shifting shadows create instability and uncertainty, but consistency brings stability. Be consistent in treating your children. And in these ways, we can demonstrate these biblical attributes of our Father in heaven to a world that needs help in their families. We have an amazing Father who has loved his children with an astounding, amazing, everlasting love. 
my hope is that you get to see that. You saw something of that in what God has done to bring us into his family so that we can leave here today rejoicing in the fact that we have a heavenly father who loves us and cares for us and has done more than we could ask or think to be our father and to call us his sons and daughters. While we may not be the best father in the world, we know God the Father, who is our Father. Let us pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for what you have done. And we stand amazed and in awe and in wonder. And we offer you the glory, for you've done it in a remarkable and wonderful way. And because of what you've done, we now stand as your children, redeemed, saved, protected, cared for, promise, promises to us for everlasting life with you forever. And so bless. Thank you for being our Father. In Jesus' name, amen.